Uh, start with a story, right? So we know who you are, but we want to know why should we care? What's devastating about all these uniforms that are being thrown out or wasted or, or the fact that we're only focused on high end fashion and we're missing this whole segment? What's but, the business model? What's the impact? No, the thing is, I mean, we all should care. It's our planet. We live on one planet and it is up to us to ensure that the future is right. So all of us must care. And in terms of fashion industry, that's the third most carbon emitting industry in the world after construction and what's the other one? Food, sorry. So every year there's, you know, tons and tons. It's to be precise. Yeah, 64 billion garments are produced and most of it goes to waste. Tell um, me about that. What's 64 million garments? What does that look like? How many buses does that fill? How many airplanes does that fill? How many, you know, children are starving because of that? Like, make it feel real for me. Anytime. Notice for all of you. I love this. Abby. Thank you so much. I love anyone. Now you're ripping it apart. I'm building it up. Just the opposite. We're making this because I, by nature, I care about sustainability a lot. So now we're going to build it up to make everyone care, right? That's what we have to do is we have to figure out what's going to make the audience care. And we need to pull at their heartstrings immediately. And At the I planet itself, just impact people care about. But yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yes. We need to put it in perspective, in other words. So yeah, yes. this, let me put it in perspective. Maybe there's less than 1% of garments that are being recycled today less than 1%. That's, I think that there's no perspective needed for that. Or maybe three out of five garments that we wear usually end up in landfill. Yes. Um, so Abby, I'm going to leave you here with this last thought. Ready? And everybody who's paying attention, ready? I'm an investor. I want to know that there's a good impact and I want to know what the business model is. Tell me in one story why should I care about school uniforms? How is it negatively impacting? And what's the business model that's going to not only bring a, a better solution, but also bring a monetary value? One story, two, three sentences. What about that do I care? Make it visual, make it emotional, make it compelling. And you'll have your funding. Thank you so much for being our warm up. <laughs> It was amazing. I, you deserve a round of applause. It's not easy. Absolutely. And thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for starting on such a different note, like, like every every time else. I'll just give a very quick two minutes introduction and starting, and then you know I leave the floor to you. So hi everyone. Thanks for joining in. Today's session is designed based on popular demand from Lisa founders to learn more about pitching and how to pitch with confidence and also a little bit more about storytelling in their pitching and you've already seen what abby and you know the interaction between abby and and lisa for those of you who do not know lisa which i wouldn't believe you would but it is lead incubator and startup accelerator started by lead participants for lead participants and myself and edward are founding partners and we both are here to kind of you know, help you guys present Lisa Kristen today, who is joining us as special guest for the session. This would be 90 minute session about pitching with confidence and avoiding the top mistakes new entrepreneurs make when preparing for the pitch. And with that, I would just leave it to Lisa to introduce herself first and take us through the session. And definitely Lisa, just, you know, I mean, definitely from the founder's perspective, but there is huge, I mean, lead community here who may not be founders, but we thought it was very interesting for them as a topic. So we opened it to the larger audience for you. So Amazing. Thank you so much, Deepi. And, and thank all of you for joining. I am a very open presenter. So if we're going along the way and you're not getting what you need, just raise your hand and ask for it. <laughs> Let me know. I'm happy to go, as you saw, off script and do whatever it is that's going to make these 90 minutes very valuable for you. If I speak too fast, too slow, just let me know. And I'm really excited to be here with you all today. I thought, yeah, Pritam, you've already got a question. I love it. Get engaged. Come on. No, it's it's not really a question, but I wanted to say, you know, I'm based out of India. And uh, when I saw the invite, I really excited, although it's almost end of day at my end, primarily because I've heard so much about the work you do. And it's really an honor to be part of this and kind of listen to the session today. 
Thank you so much. That really warms my heart and makes me really happy to be here. So thank you. I hope I can live up to your expectations. You let me know at the end. <laughs> so I do want to start off with a story. And this is a real story about an entrepreneur. I'm not going to give you his real name, so we'll call him Josh. And Josh was, of course, having trouble getting funding. He was based out of Dubai. So you know there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of VCs out there looking to invest. And he was developing a beverage company and he was really interested. He had a background in hospitality. He had a background in understanding hotels. And he was really interested in making a new beverage concept that could fit in the mini bars. So I asked him to walk me through his pitch. And actually the deck was perfect. It was maybe 10 slides, visually beautiful, covered all the main components. He was enthusiastic. He was very clear about what he was saying. He felt very confident. He felt like he had all that he needed to make this a successful pitch. But then I started asking him some questions, right? So I started to try to kick the tires a little bit and understand what's wrong with what's currently stocked in the mini bar, right? And don't hotels have already commitments with a, a, a Nestle or a Coca-Cola that already have those stocked? And why wouldn't the larger company just take over what you're doing, keep the same distribution channels that they have, and then you know go in for it? And by the way, if, if Hilton did say, yes, yeah, sign me up, Marriott said, sign me up. Would you be able to do all the logistics for a global adventure here? And then I started going, well, maybe your financials are a little bit optimistic. Are you really sure about them? And how did Josh respond? Was he like, oh, wow, wonderful, amazing questions? No. It was like, ah, you don't understand the industry that well. And obviously, this would all work out. And the financials, I've calculated them. They're all right. And the customers are going to want it. So I know the hotels are going to want it. And so I would just work with a different financer if, if you weren't interested and you didn't really have the expertise in this field. So I'm going to ask you, what went wrong in that pitch? What do you think? Someone come off mute or type into the chat box. What went wrong with that pitch? Because obviously he wasn't getting funding. <laughs> Not for me, at least. <laughs> what went wrong? Ruling out the VC way too soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shutting down, right? Uh-uh. Okay. It's not a good fit. Bye. Perfect. Oh, if you have your hand raised. I think lack of, you know, a, a well thought out solution to the problem. So the problem is well articulated, but, you know, there's gaps in the, in the solution that has been proposed. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else? One last person. What do you think? What went wrong with that pitch? I, I think uh, he did. Uh, sorry, go on. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I think this presenter did not learn much and sort of totally killed the creativity of that meeting, that pitch. Yeah, exactly. Bella, did you want to share one last thing? We'll sneak you in. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I feel like he, like a really, it's a very normal thing for someone to respond with a question for extra information and he just dismissed it away. Well, he's never going to get to the end of any pitch because everyone's going to have a follow-up question. And if they don't have a follow-up question, you don't want them investing. So that would be my, my sort of thought. Yes. So now you're starting to get it. Can I ask for those of you who have your hands raised, is it to add a comment here or to ask a question? because I will answer any questions you want right now. If it's to add here, we're gonna to get to a lot more information about it in, in the next slides. So Rick, did you wanna ask a question? It really, it was an observation. It was an opportunity that was lost that he had. You all could have... get it. You yeah. all get it. So here's the thing, like I said, he, he was not open to learning. He was not open to co-creating. He was not open to fixing his pitch. He wasn't open to hearing the concerns. He went way too defensive, way too quickly. And I can tell you from my side, it wasn't necessarily that the business idea was a bad one, but I wouldn't have trusted him. I wouldn't have had the confidence in him that he would be the right person to run the business. 
And believe me when I say, I really have a sense for who people are and how they can run the business because it's my job, <laughs> right? So who am I? I am an executive coach, but really much more than that. I work with ultra, ultra elite performers. I work with the absolute top of the top. So the best CEOs, the best entrepreneurs, you know, top athletes, top musicians. I'm working with all the people who are ready to make a huge impact in the world. So I can see the people who are talking and the people who are really doing and creating, right? And I'm working with entrepreneurs who are figuring out the manufacturing of food for when we go to Mars. That's the level of people we're working with, right? So I know what it takes within the person and beyond for them to achieve greatness. And if you want to know a little bit about me, I know everybody always wants some credibility. Who am I? I'm a top 10 executive coach. I'm part of the Forbes Coaches Council. Maybe some of you have read some of my articles on Forbes. I am a fellow member at the Institute of Coaching that's associated with Harvard Medical School. I've been featured in TV, CNN Money, Forbes, Association for Talent Development, which is a big deal for coaching and coaching world. I did grow up in industry, so I worked at Sony and AIG. I know what it looks like on both sides. And I work so often with entrepreneurs and VCs because my personal mission is to really move humanity forward and to achieve greatness. And so I like to unlock people's potential because the more you're unlocked, the higher you can go. And the more rules you break and the more creative you think, the more you're going to change society. So that's a little bit about me. Like I mentioned, I have kids. I have two daughters. I'm originally from New York, if you hear the accent, but I'm located in Zurich, Switzerland. I love reading and I love running. So if anybody wants to talk about jogging afterwards. I'm also the CEO of Kristen Coaching and Consulting. We work a lot with companies to help develop individual leaders, whole teams, and then corporations for their 21st century skills. It's all those human skills we need in the digital era. I won't spend too much time there. If you want more information, talk to me afterwards. More important is why we're here today. What are you gonna get out of today? I want you to walk away with an understanding that most people miss something very important in their pitch preparations. And very few people prepare for it and so therefore, they're shocked that they don't get funding because this is one thing that is make it or break it, but it's overlooked. So here are the things that you're often going to hear about when you say, oh, what are the mistakes when, when pitching? You're going to look in a magazine. You're going to ask some mentors. You're going to go take some more Lisa classes. And there are people who can give you the hard skills about pitching. Here's how you write your slide deck. Here's how you do your story. Here's how you make sure your business numbers add up. I want to open you up to something different because the most overlooked mistake is not showing that you are trustworthy to deliver what you say you're gonna deliver. And I really want you to sit and think about this for a moment. Most VCs, whether they say it out loud or not, I know what they say behind closed doors. <laughs> they know ideas are gonna change. You're gonna to have to pivot that, you know, at some point someone's gonna outperform you and you're gonna to have to change again your business model. What they really need to know is, are you the right person at the front, at the helm, who they can trust to go through all those waves? Can you bring it forward, you and your team, okay? So I'm looking for two volunteers. Actually, let's make it one volunteer. Anybody? There are 17 of you, as I understood, who are real entrepreneurs going through the pitching process or soon to be going through the pitching process. So looking for one volunteer. Pritam, you're the first hand up. Thank you. You've got 30 seconds and you're going to pitch us. <laughs> Why should we invest 30 seconds? Why should we invest in you or your startup? If you don't have a startup, we can talk just about you. Don't just go for it, okay? I'm going to start the clock. Don't overthink it. Okay. Hey, how many of you have actually invested in crypto? 
or have you even dreamt of buying an amazing art or an amazing apartment somewhere in new york or buying that expensive pablo painting well the solution is here using creating tokenized assets both art or real estate which you can easily buy through crypto ooh la la everybody give some applause all right what a great job that you did first of all congratulations on having the courage to just speak up i really didn't give you any advance warning you didn't even know what you were volunteering for that was so great <laughs> and you started with a story. Now here's where you're going to run into trouble. This is real live, right? We can have the most perfect pitch. How many of you in the last month, 2 weeks have read about crypto and how it's tanking and how it's going down and how it's not the solution of tomorrow? Right. So even though your pitch would have been maybe perfect a month ago, it has to completely switch now right why should we trust in crypto why is this going to be the secret deal that's going to survive whereas those other guys aren't we have something so unique that we're going to come out the victors out of this crypto war right so again amazing notice how dynamic as an entrepreneur you have to be you can have the perfect pitch and have to change it on a dime you are also going to have to do that depending on who your audience is by the way depending on where the vc or the investor specializes you might go the sustainability route because you know they're looking for sustainable investments you might go the female founded route because you know they're looking for female founders you might go the financials route because you know they really care about so even the same company where you're pitching might sound a little bit different but however you show up no matter if you're put under pressure you show up confident and i really want to make clear what confidence is because i want you to remember goldilocks and the three confidences okay confidence is not arrogance i'm brilliant and you would be lucky to have me right you know this brilliant jerk steve jobs kind of vibe going Mm -mm. That's actually not what VCs want. They don't want anyone who's tough to work with. They also don't want someone who doesn't even believe in themselves. Oh, nobody's going to fund me. This is hard. I don't know about my idea. No, then you're not the right person who's going to come and lead in tough times. They want someone who's confident. I don't need to overprove. I'm not nervous. I'm just here. I'm taking up my fair space. I have a good product. I'm confident within it. So what does it mean to pitch with confidence? I gave you a few ideas. These are from my perspective. For your list it might look a little bit different. You might add some things, you might subtract some things. You do always want to be authentic. You want to pitch with confidence that's right for you. I've recently been helping someone who's pitching and you know, he's a self-proclaimed dork. So in his pitches as he's giving speeches, he wants to talk about dragons and he wants to show cat memes. Sure, that's him, that's his style and that brings out his best confidence. So show up as you, show up visionary, catch us all, think about us, be charismatic, engage us, show us that you show up strong, you're resilient no matter what happens. Someone asks a tough question. I got this. You have to obviously know a little thing or two about business and finances. Be ready to pivot, always be ready to learn and be committed. So when you're thinking I want to pitch with confidence, you can already know what exactly does that mean? What are the behaviors that I'm looking for that I want to project? Now here's the thing, we can end right now if it were very easy to do these things. We could just say, "Okay, great, thanks Lisa, we've got the list. We'll go out and make that happen." Doesn't work that way. Why doesn't it work that way? Well, we're going to go back to the basics of what holds you back from actually showing up with confidence. We're going to go to how your brain works. Did you guys know this was going to be a brain workshop? So, very important if you take your hand, sometimes it's easier to do it like this. You take your hand, right or left doesn't matter, and you put it on the back of your head, right back here, right where sort of the neck is meeting the hairline. This you might know it is your amygdala, your fight or flight, your lizard brain, many different things that we've called it, right? And here is where your fear center is. Here's where all of your threat detection is. 
Okay, now you can take your hand and put it right on your forehead. <laughs> Great, this is the smartest part of your brain. This is called your prefrontal cortex. This is where creativity, this is where resilience, connection, optimism, future-oriented thinking, rationality, this is the part that differentiates us from other animals. So it's a pretty important part of our brain, yes? Now, here's the problem. Your brain thinks in one direction. It starts back here. And only if it doesn't feel a threat, can you actually send resources to the smartest and best part of your brain? So I want you to begin to think about this amygdala. You've heard of it, the amygdala hijack, this fight or flight. It's actually just the bodyguard to getting to the creative resourceful part of your brain. So if you want to maximize everything you're doing, if you want to show up confident, if you want to show up with your best creative self, got to get past the bodyguard. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about now, because your body has one job, one. Anybody know what's the one job of your body? What do you think? Someone say it out. You're an animal. Your body has one job. Survive. Protect. Survive. Survive. Your body only wants you to stay alive. That's it. So your body will always be looking for threats fight or flight, right? Friend or foe, is this or isn't it? Hmm? So we're constantly looking for threats. This is not something you control. This happens automatically. So now I'm gonna look for one volunteer, but this time it's gonna be a little bit different because I'm going to be selecting the person at random, okay? And when I select the volunteer, and it's whether you have your camera on or off won't change whether or not I select you, when I select you, I'm going to ask you to sing your favorite song for 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> so um, what do you think? Should I go um, alphabetically? Maybe, oh, maybe I should get the people who came first. You know, they were, they seem really eager, right? Or I don't know, Deep Valerie, Valerie, what do you think? Maybe you pick a name or... As long as you don't take me and Valerie because we joined the first. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, who should we pick? Who's the lucky winner? I'm thinking Amy, Amy Pragel. You're on my list. Okay, so Amy, how are you feeling right now? Unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So Amy, before you start, before you start, you need to know one thing. You don't actually have to sing anything. <laughs> but what I wanted you all to feel, what did you feel when I said I'm going to pick someone at random and you have to sing? Uh, I was loosely calculating the probabilities and the thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anxiety. Everyone was going, is it going to be me? What song would I sing? What's my favorite song? Am I going to sound really bad in front of everybody? What are the chances she's going to pick me? What if I turn my camera off? Notice what happened to you. You went through a panic mode. Amy, thank you for being our panic friend. You do not have to sing. You're welcome to if you want to, but you don't have to. <laughs> Because the real point is, in the modern times, the threats we're looking for, it's not, oh my gosh, is my body going to survive? Is a lion going to come and eat me? The real threat that we're looking for is the fear of judgment by other people. And what you just felt when I said, you're going to sing in front of us, <gasps> I don't know these people. I can't sing in front of them. I don't have, a, I didn't warm up. I'm not prepared. That is your fear of judgment. So for anyone who tries to tell me, I'm not afraid of pitching, I'm not fear, afraid of people's judgments, bullshit, you just felt it. <laughs> but what I do want you to know is everybody's fears are a little bit different or we handle fear a little bit differently, right? One of you said, and I love this, I couldn't see who it was. I was just calculating my opportunity for who I, was I gonna be selected, right? You just went hyper rational. You just went for the saboteur that said, don't let emotion in. Let me just calculate, figure it out, keep it dry, keep it factual. That will protect me, okay? Now we all have different protection opportunities. So what is the avoider gonna do? La la la, everything's great, everything's optimistic. This is such a fun opportunity. A little bit toxic positivity, yes? 
Now, all of these saboteurs come from a model called positive intelligence. It's by a Stanford lecturer, which is why I selected to use it for our time together today. There is, if you go on the positiveintelligence.com website, you can actually take a free mini quiz or assessment, and you can figure out which of these sabotage voices come to you. So I can give you examples for every single one. Many of you are probably a hyperachiever. I love achieving. I have to get the next thing. Who cares what I did yesterday? What matters is tomorrow. I got to go on to the next one. I have to prove myself. Or as entrepreneurs, I often see restless. This is cool. This is shiny. I should do this thing. Oh, maybe I should do this. Oh, what about this? Oh, this could be a cool project too. I see so many opportunities. I'm all over the place. These are all saboteurs. These are all ways that your body and your mind are responding to fear. And you have a master judge, a master saboteur, which is called your judge. And your judge is the person who says things like, you didn't prepare enough yet. You weren't ready yet. You're not smart enough. They're more powerful than you are. You got rejected last time. Why is this gonna be any different? Listen, I'm helping you, friend. You're not cut out to be an entrepreneur. You're going to fail. So please stick with your corporate job. I, I'm protecting you from looking stupid. And here's the thing about your judge. Your judge will take something that's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit true and make it seem 100% true. But it's not. Because I wrote here, these are the lies your judge will tell you. And you probably actually believe these lies. We all do. Because this is how our human brain works. Our human brain is protecting us from looking stupid in front of other people. Okay? So when we say, hey, pitch with confidence. Oh, so easy. Not so easy. You have these voices to contend with. But here's what you need to know. Up to... 95% of your life, of the way you run your life, your behaviors, your thoughts, your decisions, your actions are done by your unconscious mind. So if you're not really aware that the saboteur voice is telling you these lies, or if you're aware, but you believe them, they are running the show. This part of your brain is running the show, not the best, smartest, most intelligent, most confident, most optimistic part of you. This part is. And if there's one thing, I'm gonna give you so many tips today, but if there is one thing I want you to take out of this is to know, don't let your mind run you. If 95% of your stuff is subconscious, do not let it run you. You run your mind you take back your control. I want you to have a badass attitude about it. I'm in control. I run this. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do here today. Sound good? Are we in the right place? Alfredo, talk to me. What questions do you have? Is that there, is there judge? I mean, the, the nine different typos or, or types that you, that you put here, is always the same for one person? or it can change depending on the situation, how you protect yourself? Such a good question. It absolutely can change. And, and by the way, it's situational, but it's also relationships. How you are with your parents is a little bit different than how you are with your friends, which is different than how you are with strangers, right? Mm -hmm. All of these are measures to protect yourself. So most of us, you, we all have a judge that stays, most of us have one, two, or three other of the saboteurs that we sort of rely on the most. So you see in here, for example, I had a client who was an avoider. So he was telling me, I'm too busy to start my startup. I have this idea. I know it's great. I really want to start it, but I'm so busy with my work. Recently, they've been doing layoffs at his job. He's affected. So basically, he's getting paid for six months, but has zero and it means zero work to do. Is he now working on his entrepreneurial pitch? Nope. <laughs> mm. He was avoiding it, right? So once you can know about that, why was he avoiding it? Oh, the hypervigilant. I have to make sure everything's fixed and I'm looking for what's going to go wrong in the future and I have to make sure everything is taken care of. 
The stickler, many of you will also have the stickler, you're perfectionist. I have to cut every blade of grass to be exactly right. Right? If you micromanage or if you've been micromanaged, you might recognize stickler and controller combined. <laughs> so it who you are will be different over time as well. Who you were at 20 is different than who you are at 40. Who you are when you're relaxed versus under stress, who you are with people you're familiar with versus strangers, all of those situations, your brain feels a different threat and may respond in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I could give a 90 minute lesson just talking about the different patterns that we have and where they come from in our childhoods, but that will be another day. <laughs> so I want you to remember, don't let your mind run you, you run your mind. And I picked this picture by the way, cause she was like the most badass lady I could find. And it's like, yes, that's powerful. I don't give a crap. I run my mind. So here's how you're gonna start running your mind. Right? We're going to do seven mindset shifts that are going to maximize your confidence because that's what we're here to talk about today. Someone tell me when you were going to pitch investors, what are you going to a pitch to do? Does it sound like a trick question? It's not. What are you going to do at a pitch? I mean, so your concept. Yeah, you're selling, you're convincing, trying to get funding. The very first mindset shift that you have to make to show up with confidence is resetting your expectations. Did anyone say I'm there to get rejected? Anybody? <laughs> Because here's the truth, you're going to get rejected. For the person who wants to calculate the odds, the odds are forever in your favor, you will get rejected many, 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 many times. <laughs> so the real question is, how many rejections would you like to receive before you get funded? And keep that in mind. Are you looking for, if you say one rejection, good luck, think more like 30. 50, 60, set your expectations. I know that I'm not gonna get funded in my first pitch, but there's a lot of value to me going to each one of these pitches. Anybody know Dyson, the vacuums? Do you know how many different prototypes that Dyson made before he actually came up with the one that worked? So he's an inventor in the UK. And by the way, once he had his prototype, he tried to sell it in the UK and they were like, no, nope, never going to happen. And he had to go to Japan, I think. Does anyone even have a guess for how many different prototypes he had to design before he could even have the one that worked? Say 50. 50 is a good guess. What else? 5,000. Bella, you're so close, you would win the lottery. 5,127 prototypes. Imagine his expectation was, oh, it won't work the first time, but the second or third try, that'll be it. No. So you gotta reset your expectations. It, don't be frustrated when you don't get funding the first time. Expect you won't get funding the first time. Expect it will take you 50. And by the way, here's a cheat sheet for you. Create an Excel spreadsheet now, and every time you have the rejection, start to keep track. What was the date? Who was in the room? What, you know, how did the conversation go? What pitch deck did you use? Keep your versions and talk. What questions did they have? What went well? What didn't go well? This is now becoming your learning sheet. So by the way, by the time you get to the right funding, to the right place, you had to have gone through all those experiences but you won't be frustrated along the way if your expectation is, I'm gonna swing 50 times before I even expect to have a hit. This ties in so importantly with number two. I can't tell you how many people want to prove their expertise. I am an expert, I know so much, I am so great. Let me tell you how much I know. 
This is what our poor friend Josh did in his first pitch. I'm the expert, I know. You are not there to be right. You will lose in a room full of investors if you start arguing about how right you are because you're trying to make them wrong. Why would they wanna feel wrong? You are not there to be right. You're there to learn and to get it right. And this is exactly what Microsoft did when their CEO came in, Satya Nadala. He changed the mindset. Instead of everyone coming into meetings and fighting with each other, you come in to learn from each other and to coordinate with each other. This is what Novartis is doing. And the shifts that are happening in their cultures are tremendous because you no longer have to prove in a meeting by making someone else feel stupid. You can all just be collectively smart. And that's how you learn and get the best wisdom out of your investors and your VCs. You're basically getting free advising. I mean, think about that. You paid a lot of money to come to Stanford and get advising. Now you're going to get free advising when you go to your investors, right? So don't be focused on having to prove I know it all. I'm the expert. Be open and ready to be a learn it all. And here's something else you may have noticed. I'm putting a lot of emphasis on I have to prove my expertise. Me, me, me. It's not about you. <laughs> we forget this so much because our, our brain says, careful, careful, warning, you're going to look stupid. This is the ego telling you this is all about you. Worry, worry, worry. It's not about you. Okay. So the pitch is about the customers you're gonna serve and the VCs and the audience that you're talking to. It's really not about you. One founder that I had worked with, she was really worried. She was getting all upset about how, how her pitch wasn't going well. And I talked to her about why it was so important for it to go well. What was the pressure, the stress of it? because she had some runway on her money. And she said, it's, it's not about the money. It's about that I really feel passionate that female founders need to be funded. And I said, great, use that passion, stand up, have the grit, have the resilience because you're role modeling for female founders going forward. Don't get frustrated, pave the way for those who are gonna follow behind you. And then she said, absolutely, it's not about me. It's about them. It's about the community. It's about my greater purpose. And then the rejections didn't matter. She was one step forward, one step forward, paving the path for other people. Only when you keep thinking about yourself, does your fear detection go off. This is about connection with other people. Which is why, number four, I've never heard anyone else really give this advice and I can tell you that 100% of the time it works. Call me crazy. You are there to connect with people as humans. We forget that. We're there to put on a presentation or put on a show or protect ourselves against them, be defensive or prove something to them. No, just show up there ready to connect. It's about them. They are humans. This in theory, is very easy. All of you will nod and go, yes, yes, this makes sense. We connect. Okay, we're all people. That's great. Actually, empathy is a very hard skill because our fear factor on our brain goes off before we can get to empathy. So I want you to pause for a minute. One of you who's thinking about pitching or has been pitching, I want you to, actually, I'll just do this for everyone. I want you all to think about when you walk into a pitching room, or if you're giving a presentation, for those of you who are not pitching, but you're just walking into a, uh, give a presentation at work, think about the people on the other side. What are they worried about? What's going in there wrong in their lives? Like I told you, I, I coach a lot of VCs because they have a lot of pressure. So they're feeling stress, pressure. I have to find the golden nuggets. I have to find the high performers. Where is the next unicorn? They're feeling stress. I can also tell you, statistically, it's not balanced, but people in finance and VCs get divorced a lot more often than the general population. 
So they're thinking about their divorce, their wife who's going to be, or husband who's going to be home, you know, nagging them about not being home with the children because they stayed at work. Is their business partner out earning them, right? Oh my gosh, there's politics within the VCs who are in the room. Did that person get a better deal? Is that person going to have more from this fund? And they're just people. They're worried. They have lives too. So come in and be with them. They have a fear, a fear that they won't be able to find the right business or the right pitch. You're the solution to that problem. Isn't that wonderful? They're in fear mode and you're going to help them get to seeing opportunity mode. You're going to get them out of stress mode and you're going to get them here connected. I can tell you for a fact this works because the very first time I was meeting a billionaire from the Middle East, I was like, you know, judge was going strong. Who am I? I'm a girl from Long Island. Why would a billionaire want my coaching advice? Why would I be teaching him how to be a leader? Right? Judge is going strong, strong, strong. And I have to sell. And is it going to work? And am I going to make a good impression? Am I going to do it right? And instead, I just said, you know what? If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But what I can do is really listen. I can really hear what's going on for them. What are their concerns? What are they feeling? And I can just be there with them and see, am, am I a right fit? Can I provide some help for their needs? And going in with that expectation of connecting took all the pressure off to perform. And by the way, when you do that, you get results. Focus on what's within your control. Because here's the thing, this is how Amazon does it. Amazon doesn't say, here are our financials and we got to hit the quarterly budget and this and this. Mm -mm. What they say is, here's the annual budgets that we want to hit. What's most likely to create the sale of this product? What does the web page look like? What's the, you know, how easy is it to put the click button in? What is the credit card? And they look at all of the process stuff behind it and they say, how can I iterate on the processes? that will then most likely bring the outcome that I want. They don't focus on the outcome. Why? Because the outcome is not within your control. If you're an Olympic swimmer, can you say, I wanna win the gold medal? You can't control how other people swim, right? What you can control is how you swim. So what's the time you would most likely need? What's the world record? What are the other swimmers swimming at? Okay, I need this time. Now, where can you gain some time? Is it in the stroke? Is it in the landing? You know, do you need more leg muscles? Then you can do what's within your control. Do not show up to a pitch forcing, I need funding. That's the outcome you'd like. And you focus instead on mastering your confidence, having a great pitch deck, right? All the stuff that's within your control. And you let the rest go. If you get funded, great. If you don't, great. I told you we have seven and then I'll pause for a second because I'm talking a lot. Super important. One of the biggest problems that I see is people think mental strength. I don't run my mind, my mind runs me. That means I don't have fear. I close it off in a box and I make it go away. Sorry, you're human. If your brain's working, you have fear. We proved it today asking you to sing. You are not gonna get out of life without fear. Stop pretending. So instead of ignoring fear, pretending you don't have it, running away from fear, do the opposite. You run towards it. You bring it to the forefront. You look at it. Instead of running from a big shadow from behind, you turn your flashlight, put a spotlight on it and say, I'm going to look at you straight on. And Tim Ferriss has a fantastic way of doing this. You can Google it. I think he has a TEDx talk about it as well. Fear planning. Instead of being afraid once a quarter, not even just before a pitch, which you could always do before a pitch, but just on a regular basis for everything in his life, he says, what am I afraid of? And you define it. You actually write down the fear. And then you think through, it, okay, if this was the worst case scenario, right? And if that worst case scenario happens, 
what, how could I try to prevent that? So what could I do beforehand before that worst case scenario happens? So the worst case scenario is I get laughed out of the room by an investor. How can I prevent that? Well, do the things in my control, show up prepared, dress nicely, do the best I can. Also importantly, how can I repair that? Just because you can try to prevent doesn't mean it won't happen. But oh, by the way, if I do something really embarrassing, I'm going to walk in and I trip. How could I immediately repair that? Make a joke. By the way, we do a lot of trainings on confidence in public speaking, and we plan for failure. We plan for if you're walking to the podium to give a speech and you trip, what's the joke you're going to tell? And so it doesn't feel embarrassing. You feel prepared. You know how to repair it. If you do this, the fear factor goes away. Because you know you'll do what you can to prevent it. And if it happens, you know how to repair it. It will be fine. Here's, again, the seventh important, important, important mindset shift. I can handle anything. Any one of you, please, please tell me, has any one of you never made a mistake? If you haven't, please tell me because I want to know how you did it. <laughs> Anyone here that's never failed. If you've never failed, by the way, you probably haven't done something spectacularly awesome. But you, you all lived through it. Everything that is so scary before it happens, once it happens, it's actually fine. You'll live through it. You make through 100% of mistakes and failures. Know and trust in yourself, no matter what happens, you can handle anything, okay? I help people to prepare for this by doing really easy things, especially musicians love to do this. So when you're doing an audition or when you're about to go do a pitch, first things first, Let, let's make it specific for you. First things first, before you go into a pitch, you're likely waiting in a lobby area or a waiting room area, and then they're going to open a door and come and get you. I, two weeks ago, spent 10 minutes with a woman where I had the door closed and she sat and she didn't know when I was going to open the door. Sitting in anticipation, are they coming? Are they not coming? Are they nervous? And I would open the door and we would practice that first stand up and how do you stand up and how does it look with that first handshake when you don't know someone's coming musicians will literally put water on their hands and try to play because when you're sweating things are a little different right so how do i practice when it's sweating they will set alarms in the middle of the night you can put an alarm for three in the morning wake up and you have to give your pitch if you can do that, <laughs> if you can stand outside in the rain, sometimes people, by the way, do five minutes of intense running, intense hit cardio workout, get the blood flowing, crazy adrenaline, pumping, 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 and then prepare giving your speech calm. When you prepare in these different scenarios, your mind knows, who cares? I can handle anything. I could do it nervous. I could do it sleepy. I could do it cold. I actually had a client who was in my offices and I, my offices are right across the street from Johnson and Johnson. I have a client at Johnson and Johnson. So I had a woman. In right now, we're just going to get up and walk over. <gasps> but she could handle it. After that, no VC can scare you because you can handle anything right? Build the confidence. I tell my two young daughters, they're eight and six, unless you're dead, everything else is solvable. Everything else is figure outable. So as long as you're still alive, you can handle it. That's a lot of information. I'm sorry, I have to go fast. We only have 90 minutes. This is a summary of the seven mindset shifts for maximizing your confidence. Who has questions or what, what's going through your mind right now as you're seeing all of these? Yes, Pritam, please. If you can give a bit more examples on the point number three, like it's not about me, how do you, know, you relate? Because generally most of the pitches are always about the founder and the team. Yes. Let me, let me make this distinction. 
I don't want your mindset to be, it's about me. I have to prove, I have to show I'm good enough. I have to be the expert. I have to uphold my reputation. I, you can come in and say, we as a team are going to get funding because we, for example, I was speaking with a woman the other day, she has a a scale up and they're helping bedside a diagnosis of cancer. She's walking in going, I'm helping Nancy, the woman who's laying in bed, dying of cancer. I can diagnose her sooner and better and with more empathy with my product. So if I get rejected in this pitch, that's okay. I'll go to the next one for Nancy. It's not about, you know, the, the, the rejection or the acceptance is not about me. Don't take it too personally. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah, that helps. And and just on that, on point number six, what you are saying is that, you know, kind of put the worst case scenario and just prepare for it before you pitch, right? Exactly. Don't hide from it. This is the uh, literally the number one thing. I probably repeat it to clients 10 times before they get it. Mental strength doesn't mean ignoring emotions. It's very easy to let your emotions run you, and it's actually fairly easy to ignore your emotions. Where natural confidence comes in, and we're not going to talk about it today, but I can talk about it in the Q&A if you want. Natural confidence comes in when I don't let emotions control me either way. I don't have to fall under them. I don't have to run from them. I notice them. I feel them. And then I choose what I want to do with the information that they're sharing. That's next level. Come on. That's the next session here. (laughs) Thank you for the, for the questions. And if anybody else has any, please interrupt, speak out, call me along the way. I know I'm going fast. Like I said, I want to get you all this good stuff. You can always watch the recording again, if you want to really let it sort of sink in. Here's the other super important skill set that everybody misses. I don't know why. Actually, I do know why, because I worked in business too. We think we're strong, we're tough, we're business people, we're rational. We don't need any of this soft skills stuff. Athletes, musicians, they would never go before a game or an audition and not have a pregame routine that primes their brain and gets them ready for success. They would just never. And in business, this is only slowly catching on. So I want you to start to make it a habit and a practice anytime you're going to do something important, whether it's a pitch, whether it's an important meeting, whether you're going to ask for a raise, whatever it is, have a pregame routine. And I'm going to tell you some easy things that you can do that are going to maximize what works in your brain. I won't get into all of the details about why this stuff works. You'll just have to trust me. The brain science and all of the research is here. (laughs) You, when you visualize your success, sounds soft. Oh, I'm going to visualize that I'm winning. It actually is a way of hacking your brain. Because your brain, when you can get to immense detail and you can really use your imagination, your brain doesn't know the difference, right? We all think our brains are so smart. They're very easy to hack. So if you visualize, you know exactly how it's going, you're actually creating the pathways, the neurons, the connections in your brain. So your brain thinks you've experienced it. And we talked about you visualize your success but you can also successfully handle your failures, right? You're in the middle of a pitch and you were drinking bubbly water and now you burped in front of everybody. (gasps) What are you gonna do? Make a joke, right? So you can watch yourself handling failure spectacularly. I know that many business people are like, yeah, yeah, we got this, Lisa, that's not new. I, I don't need to take a note. I already know about visualizing. But what most business people don't do is actually visualize it. So what I want to do here is just take a minute for you to experience the power of visualizing your dreams. And this is specifically meant for founders. If you're not founding something yet, just be with this anyway and really feel it for yourself. So I'm going to invite everybody. You're going to close your eyes. You're going to get comfortable in your chair, two feet on the ground, shake out anything that's feeling a little tight. We're going to take a big, deep breath in. And 
and let it all out. You're going to imagine yourself walking in the building where your investors are located. Notice what you're wearing, the color of your clothing and the style of your shoes. Notice what you're carrying in your hands and your shoulder. When you look around, you're noticing how warm and inviting the lobby entrance is. The receptionist warmly greets you and takes you into a waiting area. They ask if you'd like a coffee or a tea, and you are so happy to accept your favorite beverage. And you realize you're enjoying this moment of anticipation. You're sitting, noticing. You're feeling optimistic and excited. I have a great pitch ready. I have a great opportunity for these investors. I'm here to connect with them human to human. I'm here to learn from them. I'm excited that I can handle anything. The investors walk over to welcome you and they shake your hand. You notice how many of them there are, what they're wearing, their ages, and you notice the smiles that are crossing their faces. You notice how at ease you're feeling, how confident you're feeling, like when you're entering a friend's house that is familiar and inviting. You start your pitch exceptionally well. You have a compelling story and it immediately captures their attention. You notice the investors are nodding their heads. They're taking notes in their notebooks. You're going through your pitch, you're going through your slides and each one is coming out smooth and articulate. And the investors have questions and you feel yourself excited and invigorated by their engagement. They're interested. They're listening to you seriously. You answer their questions with ease. You're getting into the flow of your passion and your enthusiasm about this opportunity. You have worked incredibly hard. You know your numbers. You know your business. You know your impact. And now is your chance to shine. The investors are starting to ask tougher questions. And you know that means they're even more interested. You're feeling excited. This is the feeling of the opportunity coming closer and closer to you. As your meeting time comes to an end, the lead investor thanks you and shakes your hand. They say they're interested. They want to speak to you as soon as you can and start to drop terms of a term sheet. You smile knowingly because you know this is the right investor and the right opportunity for you to find a true partner. You shake hands and you feel happy. Take a deep breath. Notice how you're feeling right now in this moment. One more breath. And I'll invite you to open your eyes again. How was that experience? Does anybody want to share with us? What did you imagine? What was it like there? What were you wearing? <laughs> you don't have to share if you want to keep that for yourself, but notice the calm, the peace, the confidence it can bring you. 
Notice how it already feels like you've had a bit of a win. And you can practice these for yourself. You can write these for yourself. You can practice this every day in the mirror. Have this pregame routine where you visualize things going well for you. It will train your brain to actually make it happen. Yes, one guy. Yeah, I actually just wanted to share. It was quite interesting that, so when you said walk in through the lobby, and so what I was wearing when I walked in through the lobby, because I guess I was still uptight, so I felt very professional and I need to, you know, be dressed, you know, like in heels and everything. But the minute you said, the investors say hello, they're smiling at you, my outfit changed. Right? Ah. So, <laughs> yeah, so I got more comfortable. This just when you know just the description this description of it so that was I just wanted to point that out that was very interesting to me that that okay. happened. amazing because that's what it is when we're fear we go I have to look a certain way I have to act a certain way I have an expectation of how I should show up and as your body relaxed out of fear and really into this connection opportunity mode you found your true self I <laughs> I'm going to invite you the next time you go for a pitch, go in that second outfit, see the power you feel showing up confident as you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Srikant. Yeah. So uh, what's interesting was, you know, I was able to visualize everything that you described and probably uh, related to my successful experiences in the past. But what was interesting is, you know, when you said, you know, you've acquired the funding, I, I felt the accomplishment for a split second. And then I started worrying about how do I execute now? Now that I have money, I have to start executing. So what's my next step? You know, and my brain was like going on and on. And I was like, oh, this is something I need to work on because Yes. I just, I just secured funding. I'm supposed to relax, right? Not worry about next steps. <laughs> I love it. So who knows which saboteur just came up, right? The, right. The, the, you exactly had it. You had that moment of success, amazing accomplishment. <gasps> Fear trickled right back in. What am I going to do? How am I going to do that? Yeah. And that's such a great noticing on your part. And you can actually start the visualizations of, I know how to plan for the next steps. Everything goes smoothly. I go back to my team. We can figure it all out, right? And so you can start to soothe out the fears. This is very common, by the way, especially for the hyperachiever. We don't know how to celebrate success. We just are looking forward quickly. <gasps> What's ahead? Hypervigilant. Don't let it fall. Don't let it break. Thank you so much for sharing this because it is a constant working with the mind. You get past one place and you find another roadblock, another fear place where your saboteur comes in. The more you can unlock, the more you can work past the roadblocks, the more successful you'll be. And by the way, the farther ahead you'll get from anyone else who hasn't done the work. This is your differentiating factor. So thank you for bringing that up. Willow, what was your experience? Hi, first off, thank you so much. This is so incredible to, to get to share and hear from you with everything that you've done. So thank you. My question was around the way that you started. You started with telling a story, which I thought was really powerful. And then you introduced yourself. I'm curious if you have a recommendation on that. I own a creative agency. And so I am pitching constantly, but it's a service-based business. So it's a little bit different and introducing myself and then also giving space, holding space for other people to introduce themselves is really important, but sometimes yes. it can also throw off because it starts to feel formal immediately. So yeah, I would love to hear your opinion there, Lisa. Yes. So Willow, this is a really good, interesting question. I'm a fan of always doing something a little bit different because when you do something different, like we're all in autopilot. Remember I said 95% we're just sort of in autopilot. If you can spark someone's interest, you switch them out of autopilot and they're tuned in and they're listening. So for example, I own this coaching business. We do leadership development. So depending where I am, let's say I'm at a networking event, I'm trying to get a, a corporate client. When they ask me, what do you do? I don't answer. 
Instead, what I say to them is, well, let me ask you a question first. Tell me about your favorite boss. Oh, this person, this, this, and this. Tell me about your least favorite boss. Oh, well, that guy did this, and this, and this, and this. And I said, perfect. I work with your great boss to make them even better. And I work with the boss you didn't like to help them to become more like your great boss. Oh, I'm interested, right? I didn't pitch them. I didn't sell them. I didn't give them a pitch. I helped them find an emotional connection to the topic. And then I connected myself to that. Your audience, it's always about them. If you're ever wondering, we're all ego-based. <laughs> we all think about ourselves all the time, even for people who are givers, by the way. This is a common misconception. The people who are people pleasers and love and want to give it to you all, it's because that's how they feel worthy because of their ego. They need to tell themselves I'm worthy because of something. I won't go into too much psychology here, but I just want you to know everybody's often thinking about themselves. So if you can figure out how to get yourself out of it, and if you can figure out how to pitch to the other person, what's their thoughts, what's their needs, what are they interested in, you will hit a home run every time. So I hope, Willow, that helps. Of course, afterwards, we can talk more in detail if you want to talk through your specific situation. <laughs> but that I just was super wanna... helpful. Thank you. I love that. Good. Yeah, I want to open your eyes that just because there's a way of doing it doesn't mean that needs to be the way you do it right? A, a big key component, darn it, I wish we had more than 90 minutes. A big key component that I coach most entrepreneurs on is audacity. Being bold and a, almost on the edge, not immoral. I'm not talking about doing any Theranos stuff, <laughs> but just like, an, did, did they really just do that? Did that really just happen? Because audacity is what makes people believe they're going to stand out. They're going to change the world. They're going to do what it takes, right? So for example, I had a person who was trying to recruit one of my clients and said, I really want you to come be a CFO for this company. And my client said, no, thank you. I already have a great job starting a business. She actually left her job to become an entrepreneur. No, thanks. I'm starting my own business. Yeah, but I really think you, you know, they're looking for a CFO and you'd be a really good fit. Appreciate it. Very flattering. I'm not interested. I'm starting my own business. Well, let me just connect you and we'll figure out, you can just meet them and see what it's all about. Thank you. I'm not sure I need to meet them because I have my own business. Oh, okay. But you know what? If you just meet him, I'll just set a meeting for you. How about next Friday? And we'll pick, okay. By the time that conversation was over, she was meeting with the CEO and now they're talking about her taking the job. You have to have a little audacity to push, even, you know, if someone said no, or to ask to get to the front of the line or to ask, oh, you're, you're booked out. You can't take on another client. What would it take for me to get to the top of your waiting list? When they say, no, thank you, I won't fund you. Amazing. What would have been the differentiator for you to fund us? Show that audacity, that stepping up, that stepping beyond what's the norm, and you will start to unlock doors that nobody else can. I want to go on. I have so much more to say about that, but I do want to make sure that we actually tie this back to what we just said, which is, we need to celebrate success. You got funded and take more than one second. <laughs> so you come before we say, oh, but we have to start planning and what about this and next and we have to do that. We have to celebrate our successes. And before you go into a pitch, think about every major accomplishment you just did. Don't worry about being humble. Some cultures, they say you have to be very humble. You can't say nice things. This is just for you. So you don't want to be humble. You want to brag. You want to give yourself compliments. Stand in front of a mirror. By the way, this is very hard for people. Stand in front of a mirror and start to give yourself compliments. You did an amazing presentation today, Lisa, at the Stanford you know, program today. Wonderful job. You really did an awesome job. I had an article published last week. That was a really important article. And people really resonated with that on emotional articulation. Well done, you. Hey, you just recently booked a new client that's going to bring in, you know, a, a significant amount of revenue for the company. Start to celebrate. Remind yourself, tell your brain, you've done some amazing things. Put yourself in that mindset. I can do it again.
Here's the last thing that I really request from people in their, this is a minimum pregame routine, which is have music. Music changes you whether you want it to or not, doesn't matter, your brain responds to music. So I actually put together a little Spotify playlist here and you can look for it or I'll put it into the chat box later. The, you can look for the playlist, Stanford Lead, Lisa Pre-Pitch Motivation. And I've put in some really good music in there. I've got like Eye of the Tiger that's already in there. And I've got Tina Turner, he's simply the best. And it's open for collaboration. Please, everyone go in, add your songs. That way, when you're preparing, you're not alone in preparing. You know, oh my God, I have this amazing community of entrepreneurs who are here with me in spirit. They're celebrating my success. They want me to succeed. They want to see me shining. You're not alone in this. You've got this community and pump yourself up. I won't play any music right now. So this is the top 10 tips for maximizing your confidence. The first seven were about the mindset shift. Mindset shift is something you can work on all the time. It's not just for pitching, it's for everything. <laughs> the pregame routine, you can use that. That's eight, nine, and 10. You can use that before any major event, not just pitching. Here's why I spent the majority of our time talking about preparing instead of actually how to show up at the pitch. Aren't you thinking like, oh my God, Lisa, now you're not going to have any tips for us in the pitch. And that was the most important part. Showing up strong in the pitch is actually mostly done. Most of what you need to show up strong and have the confidence in the pitch is all the pre-work of those other 10 things. The most important thing you can do, remember that your judge is strong. It will be there. You wanna learn how to turn down the voice of your saboteurs. It has to be perfect, it has to be right. You're gonna mess it up if you go too soon. They didn't fund you last time, they're not gonna fund you this time. Banish it. Remember that this is the bodyguard. You will never be at your best if you're letting the judge run you. This is hard for people because you think the judge motivates you. Yeah, but Lisa, the reason that I had such a good pitch deck is because I was so nervous it was going to be wrong that I spent a ton of time working on it. So the judge is a good motivator for me. The judge is helpful for me. No, <laughs> there is truth to what the judge might be saying. Hey, you should prepare. But the best place to get that wisdom from is not the emotional fear part. It's this part, your creative, rational, best thinking part. This is stress. This is fun, excitement, opportunity, connection. You can do the same activity. One is very stressful. One is very invigorating, very exciting. You don't need the bodyguard. You need to get rid of the bodyguard. And remember that you run your mind. It's a muscle. Yes, Shrikan, tell um, me, talk to me. Yeah, so, so I, I feel like I rely on my primitive brain to, to make the right decisions because, you know, it's also protecting and, you know, guiding you on uh, you know, what to do or what not to do. So just imagining, you know, shedding that part of the brain off is like me, <clears throat> me spending a weekend with my friends in a party, you know, getting drunk and, you know, just saying whatever I want to say. So <laughs> I, how, how do I find the balance, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, such a good question, because please doesn't mean live without any consequences, right? <laughs> this is not like a no regrets free pass. Right. But I want you to think about if you know what you want, I really want to found a business. I really want to make a difference. You don't have to say, I need to control it. I need to make it perfect. You can say, I want it to be great because I want to have this happen in the world. So it's not you don't you give up on risks. You don't take any precautions. You don't plan anything. It has nothing to do with that. 
It's just which part of the brain is looking at the risks. Is it, you're going to mess this up? Do I have to protect what I have? Or is this, there's a great opportunity and I want to give my best. And this is the best part of your brain. You will burn out. Trust me, I work with a lot of very successful people who are on the brink of burnout because they use this motivation for too long. Your body is not meant to live in adrenaline and cortisol states, stress states for 20 years, right? Right. So we're going to switch our mindsets. I come to this part of my brain. This knows what's the best thing to do here. Very cool. Thanks for your active participation. I know some of you, many of you will ask me, okay, Lisa, sounds good, but how do I do that, right? It's so easy for the fight or flight or the fear to step in. So the only thing you really need to do in the moment, someone asks, the VC asks a very tough question and you're going panic, panic, alert, warning, right? You've forgotten all of your pre-stuff, warning, warning, warning. You just need to make a pause. Once you can pause for one second, you have the opportunity for choice. If you don't pause, amygdala hijack everything and fear takes over. So I have some very clever ways. This was you know, me as a teenager trying to sneak past the bodyguards. Here are some very clever ways for what you can do. First of all, just take a breath. I know it's so annoying that everybody says breathe, but to be honest, when you're in fight or flight, your body's very tense and it thinks I have to run, I have to do something. If you tell your body, no, I'm safe enough that I can take a full breath, you are sending a signal to your body, oh, then it must not be that dangerous. There's no lion chasing us, it's fine. So that's you actually biochemically hacking your body and your brain to relax. You can take a drink, something bad happens, you do this to buy yourself a second to, and be able to answer. Count to 10 in your mind. Write yourself a little note to remember. Have a mantra. Rub your fingers together. By the way, this is a very easy mindfulness trick. If you're in a meeting and it looks weird to do this, because this brings, you can all try it here. Once you focus for a second and just feel your two fingertips rubbing together, you're back in your body. You're out of the spinning. You're out of the future. You're out of the past. You're just here. And that can create a, a pause. If you can't do this in a meeting because it looks weird, wiggle your toes in your shoes or put your feet on the ground or feel your elbows in your chair. Just do something physical to bring you back to your body at this moment. And then you have choice again. Probably not in a pitch, but in other situations, you can walk away. You can zoom out for perspectives and give yourself a hug. Have some self-compassion. Wow, I really messed that up. Before my judge starts spiraling out, that's a good thing that I can laugh about at my dinner party later, right? Have some self-compassion. Everybody makes mistakes. It happens to everyone. I just want to share with you my personal go-to. You'll have to find your own mantra of what works for you. I have a go-to that always works for me. When I'm feeling stressed and I want to control and I want to fix and I want my outcomes, my shoulders get really tense. So what I figured out is I go, I actually physically, if I'm not with other people, do this. I scrunch myself up as tight as I can, put my arms out and I open. And then I open, open, open. And what I tell myself is let go in order to let in. So I'm, I'm holding, I'm clenching, I'm tightening. I have to let it go. And once I let go, I'm trying to control, trying to be perfect, trying to have the right answers, let go of the fear. I can let in the wisdom from this part of my brain. And for me, it works every time. So you can find your mantra of what's going to help you make this switch. Practice it, practice it, practice it in your life. It will come automatically in the pitch. It's muscle memory. I know we're running low on time, so I'm going to very quickly go through all of this. The only thing I want to make sure, I think you all know it. I think you've all heard it. You have to have an action plan for continuous learning. We usually want to hide from our failures. Like, oh, that didn't go well. Okay, like, let's let that go. 
don't hide from it, face it, learn from it, have that Excel spreadsheet, right? Jeff Bezos said, I love failing. I don't love failing, but you know, it means I'm making progress. It's no problem for him that he fails. One of the easiest things you can do is just make a retrospective. So after every pitch you have, this is like an agile retrospective. It's very simple. What should I stop? What should I start? What should I do more of? What should I do less of? And what should I keep? Very simple reflection exercise. You can do it after every pitch and there you will find the way to refine. We won't be able to coach live, but I want you to think about poor Josh, who we started with in the beginning. How much could he have benefited? What would he have done differently if he had known everything that we talked about here today? And I just wanna leave you with this note. Sinclair Lewis, that's the handsome gentleman that you're looking at there. He's the first American author to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Forgive my references, my father was an English professor. So he was invited to give a speech and the room was very packed. And then Lewis walked on the stage and he asked a simple question. How many of you want to be writers? Okay, so you're at a speaking event to see an author, they all raise their hands, right? And he said, then why aren't you home writing? and he walked off the stage. So I don't want you to learn about pitching with confidence. I don't want you to think about pitching with confidence. I want you to leave here and I want you to go out and I want you to do it. You wanna be an entrepreneur, you wanna pitch with confidence, you wanna show up anywhere with confidence, get out of here and go do it. Can you do this? Hell yeah, you run your mind, your mind doesn't run you and you're gonna enjoy all the success that follows. So with that, any questions, I'll leave my contact information here for a minute and then I'll stop sharing my screen and I'm here for you. Just to let you know, I know we're so tight on time. I'm happy to stay later and answer any questions for anybody who wants to stay or you can feel free to contact me afterwards and send me an email, a WhatsApp, connect with me on LinkedIn and we can continue the conversation. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't see the chat while I was, while I was speaking. So if anybody had anything urgent in there, let me know. While the questions start pouring in, I just wanted to thank you as well, Lisa. It was so amazing and really, really happy that we asked you to come here and you agreed to, to join us today. And I'm, I mean, we originally designed this for Lisa Founder, but I'm pretty sure the whole lead community really found it very, very useful. And we're going to also put the recording out there. And at the same time, I mean, I really want to tell you that how powerful was this visualization technique that you talked about. I have been actually doing it for years, but in a very different way. Whatever I want to achieve in my life, this is a fun fact about me, I actually put it in my wall and with a picture and writing what exactly I want. And there's never been a time when I've not achieved it just because it's there until you get it, right? So, I mean, that was really, really powerful. One of the things that you kind of added. Yeah. Uh, but thank you so, so, so much for joining. And I could see from the engagement here that everybody quite enjoyed it. And I then let everybody else ask questions now. <laughs> yes, I see. I see lots of people saying, thank you. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you all. You make the space this, you know, uh, open and flexible. You were all jumping in and participating. That's what it takes. Get that courage. Speak up. Be audacious. You can handle anything. And if you're ever feeling alone, lonely, depressed, you've, you've tried your 50th pitch and it didn't work. Call me, I'm there for you. You're never alone, okay? With that, I'm here for anybody who has any other questions, but I do wanna be respectful of people's time and I wanna make sure that we end on time. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Thanks a ton, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Listen, thank, thank you for zooming out of the ego and role modeling for everyone else in the community so they can learn. Thank you. So, so <laughs> do, do, do we do we go fast or does somebody else want to do?
to, to make their pitch. Did Harold request first in the chat? Should we give Harold the fair chance now? Yeah, yeah that's uh, sure. That was not the question, but yes, here we okay. are. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, Lisa, thank you, and then make sure. So what about who of us really likes taking their blood sample drawn, going to the doctor, spending time, getting there? Like, who wants it? Think about an opportunity where we can change it, get rid of blood, get rid of needles. BioRail has developed a unique technology to sample with a stamp-sized device, a little bit of your liquid from your body, which will collect 9,000 biomarker you can then use to personalize your health. I invite you to join BioRail for this awesome journey to be the next 23andMe for proteomics. Thank you. Awesome. So round of applause for your, for your great pitch. In your first story, you're right, nobody likes needles. You can do that sharper and faster. Anybody like yeah. having a needle stuck in them? No? So I, just, I just made that up. Oh, <laughs> that's that perfect. Yes. We get sharper, get it really strong, get the emotion there, right? Getting your blood drawn with a needle doesn't feel emotionally so tense. Do you like getting stabbed with a needle every time, right? Stabbed is a strong word. Do you like getting stabbed with a needle every time you have to get your blood drawn? And then the people will go, because again, it's the emotion. You want them to feel discomfort Ugh, because you're going to resolve their discomfort, aren't you? Then what was the next part? We have a new technology that is a pain-free, right? Because people are scared of needles. It feels like pain. So this problem that you're solving for them is it's pain-free. And did you also say they don't have to go to the doctor's office? Yes, yes. You can do right. it from home. Mm -hmm. Which one of those two feels more important for your audience, for your pitching? Do people say like, ah, I don't have time to go to the doctor or it's more the needle thing? I think the initial reaction is the needle. I mean, 60% of people are afraid of needles. It's just yeah. the data, right? But the other part is always about convenience. So we feel it's a good point. Go for the convenience part. You can do your testing from home. You don't have to reschedule your life to go to, to the doctor's office. Just put that thing on while you have your coffee and ship it. Good. So we start with the needle. Does anybody like getting stabbed with a needle when you have to go to the doctor's office? To get, you know, when you have to get your blood drawn, keep it simple. No? Mm -hmm. Well, we have the solution. No pain. Pain-free. And by the way, pain-free meaning... Can, you don't even have to go to the doctor's office. You can be sitting with your morning coffee, no pain, no inconvenience, right? So you can tie them together with a pain-free as your middle. Mm -hmm. And then you can show not only does it take away one, but it also solves for another. If you start with the convenience one, I'm not sure that's a problem people need solved. Mm -hmm. It's a perk but it's not the problem that needs to be solved. Unless, I'm gonna switch one last thing, Harold. Depends who you're pitching. If you're pitching B2B, if you're going to a Google and you're gonna say, hey, we can help people draw their blood at work in a simple, convenient, safe way. They don't have to go to the doctor, they this and that. Then you would wanna talk about time and convenience. It just depends who you're, who's your target audience. Makes sense, thank you. Awesome pitch, thank you. I was actually just going to jump in with one question, Lisa, and yeah. also comment to Harald exactly what you said to him. But, you know, what I also like to tell people is, are you pitching aspirin or disparin? Because aspirin is like when you're really in pain and you need to get rid of it. So you need an aspirin and that's what works. Disparin is something, yeah, okay. Or a vitamin is something which is like, all right, I can keep taking it, but you know, it's still a convenience. I mean, to, to the point what Lisa was saying, but my question to you was, and you actually kind of answered it in a way when you said, you know, who's your audience? But in his case, if he was going to pitch this to investors, I mean, they would care about the fact that, you know, how they're solving the customer's problems. But in such a scenario, should you really talk more about the end customer? Or you should talk about the pains of an investor, like how it's going to help the investor investing in his this kind of business. I mean, I've always struggled with this, this question. So Yes, it depends what the business case is, right? So if the business case is you're selling to doctors or you're selling to B2Bs, that's different than if you're selling to at home. And if depending who you're selling to, what, is, what 
is happening in their lives to really know what's the pain that you're solving for. I think the first thing grabs them, gets them interested in the product, but then you would need to tie it to the business model and the business case that you have. And that I don't have enough detail on, but we could talk later, Harold, if you want to share <laughs> a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's have someone else go. <laughs> thank you for being that brave soul. I think we had Eric and Wangi, and I'm sorry that it's an American DNA thing that we can't pronounce names, and I always apologize. <laughs> no worries, you're, you're, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah. And how, how do you pronounce it? I want to get it right. Wangoi. Wangoi. Yes. Wangoi. Yeah. Perfect. So Eric and Wangoi, please okay. go so, ahead. So, so we're great to do the pitch that we did for our last pitch day with small variation just to remove a section to make it a little bit shorter. And yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> so stating your last respects or writing your work up be uncomfortable. The main problems are that it's expensive, it's tedious, people have a fear of death, there's apathy, a lack of knowledge, and many people feel they're too young to even be thinking about it. To lend perspective to the size of this issue, it is estimated that in most developed countries, between 40 and 70% of adults do not have a will. For the most, for most of the developing world, this statistic is even worse. Our target is the end of life industry, which has come about through a series of broad societal shifts around end of life planning. From customized caskets to creating memorial objects from cremated ashes, startups across the globe have been scaling up offerings aimed at end of life planning and at memorializing the departed. The end of life industry works in an ecosystem to provide holistic services along with other industries such as legal, finance and insurance and healthcare. So Pongoi, who are we solving for? So we're solving for Tina. She's 37 years old. She's divorced and has two children. She has assets that she wants to leave behind, but she's not that educated in the intricacies of end of life planning. We're solving for Joe and Susan who are in their late 60s, they're retired and they have children and grandchildren. They have investments that they want to distribute to them, but they don't have enough information and they think that it could be expensive. And they're also thinking about advanced healthcare directives that they want to look into. We are solving for Sine and Chebet. They're married quite young in their mid thirties. The pandemic made them think about the things that they would want to do before they die. And they want to also ensure a nest egg for their, for their children. And finally, we're solving for Ivy. She's 23, just completed her first degree. She doesn't think she has any assets that she would deem worth leaving a will for, but she's also very specific on what she wants to happen once she dies. So in the end, we aim to be a highly empathetic, simple, cost-effective, and informative avenue for people to document and distribute their final say. Amazing. We're going to applaud for you guys for coming here and pitching live. Before I answer, someone else who's on the call Give me a one sentence. What is this startup about? Does this mean nobody knows? I, I hope that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what I wanted to check in. <laughs> so it's end of life planning is the, is the sense that I got. Yeah. What I didn't get a sense for, and Eric, it was a little bit fast. It was hard for us to, to process the information you were sharing. So what I didn't get a sense for is what's unique about what you're doing. What's different about what you're doing than what exists on the market? Okay. So that's a good question. We're, right now we're in the process of doing our value proposition. So we are part of the Lisa incubator. So in the process of doing our, val our value proposition, and now we're putting together the, what we'd call the, I guess the main features of what we want our solution of, or the main, uh, so the want our solution to, to provide. So what exact problems, like what we're looking at is top two problems that we want the solution to provide. Yes. And that would definitely be around, so end of life planning in terms of last respect. So just this all came about because I have, I attended, especially in the last year, a couple of funerals where we literally were guessing what people wanted to happen to, you know, when, when they had passed away. So there was a lot of guesswork happening. And then after that, there's just a lot from the perspective of what do we do now with their, with their belongings, with their assets and, and things like yeah. that. 
I, I want to catch the momentum. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to catch the momentum of your voice and tone that you had there. When you guys were pitching, it was to my head. But what you just started to get to, Angai, it was personal. It was real for you. I was yeah. attending the funeral of my grandfather or you know whomever. Yeah. And we were devastated. We were grieving. We were crying. And that was the time we had to figure out who's getting which part of the land and the furniture and this and how to bury them and what song do they want at the funeral. That's not the time. Yeah. That's that. Yes. <laughs> I feel that. Oh shit. This is some, this, that is not the time. And by the way, 60% of people don't have a will because yeah. they're scared of death and they don't want to think about death before it happens. Yeah. And now here's our solution, which makes it easy to talk about death or makes it easy for people to have the conversations or collate it all in one place, whatever the value proposition is. Make okay. it so simple. Then you can go into all the other details. They're going to want to know more and more. But in the first 30 seconds, people should really get what you're about. Okay. How does that sound? Okay. Eric, how does that resonate for you? How does that feel? Yeah, starting with a story. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> feel it. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. I, the, the approach you're suggesting, I think, captures the audience's interest right from the get-go and and uh, on top of that it's it's an emotional story so the it's very easy to to connect to so yeah i, I think it makes a lot of sense it's very easy to connect to we've all gone through a grieving process for some loved one so you're gonna recall inside of people the pain of that process they remember how hard it was they remember how terrible and crying they were then they're with you Yes, we do need this solved. Oh my gosh, 60% don't have it. That is a real opportunity, right? But the opportunity is, can you convince some percentage of that to actually use your product? Because if they're avoiding it because they have a fear of death, even if you have the best product in the world, if they have a fear and they don't want to talk about it, they're not going to talk about it. So you have to then talk about why you are going to solve this where other people haven't or haven't been able to crack that code. I have a question, Lisa. So what's the common duration of a pitch? Like how long is a pitch usually? That really depends. Is it pre-seed? Is it angel? Is it series A? Is it series B? Okay. Is it what country? Is it? <laughs> let's, let's start with pre-seed the US. <laughs> Plan for 30 minutes to an hour. Wow. Okay. It, it could be 10 minutes, depending who you're talking to. It could be 15. It could be 90 minutes. Okay. Always, no matter what, the first part of your pitch should be, you know, 10 minutes, let's say, and that can be the overview. Now, if they stop you, if they want to ask questions, if they want to go back, you can have backup slides to talk through the financials in fuller detail, but you go at the pace that they want. So if you see that they're bored looking, if they tell you you only have 10 minutes, but you can practice that, right? Tip number seven, I can handle anything. Practice giving a five-minute pitch, practice giving a 10-minute pitch, practice giving a 30-minute pitch, practice giving an hour. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Pre prepare for long and be ready to do shorts. I think one of the reasons why Wangui asked this question is because we prepared them for three minute pitches. Uh, three mm. pitches. But then Sorry. Also possible. Like I said, it really depends. But let me, let me actually take a step back for a minute. What you should really be doing well before you're ever going to pitch is networking and building the relationships. By the time you go into pitch, you should have known someone and been in contact with them for six months, nine months, right? Because you want to make sure that by the time you get in, it's a warm lead, it's friendly, and they're actually committing time to you. Wow. Okay. I like the three-minute pitch. That's good. You're <laughs> yep. in and you're out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we really prepare them for very, very... <laughs> That's why Eric was laughing. <laughs> talking about... Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so ignore my advice completely. Go you for a three minute pitch. <laughs> Absolutely not, Lisa. I mean, the real world out there, it'll be very different for them. It's just how we prepare them for... Like, prepare for all risk. the scenarios. Yeah. Prepare, exactly that. Prepare for every scenario. You need a 30-second elevator pitch. You need a three minutes at, a, you know, at a, an event. You need a five-minute if they're more interested. But you need to be prepared to go deep 
deep. If they're actually going to give you a term sheet, they're not going to want three minutes. They're going to want to really look, right? So you can yeah. be prepared for many different. Nowadays, sometimes you meet several times, but sometimes people are like, I just, I need to invest. I have money and I need it to go somewhere and it needs to hit this quarter. And they want to have fuller conversations in the moment. And you have to be ready to really go deep on that. Know what terms you want also. But I don't want to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for staying over time here. For, yes. For, you know, I mean, I Thank think you. these examples are also great for everybody. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. And okay. like I said, if there's anything else I can do for you, I'm here. You're never alone. None of you are ever alone. If you fail, that's great. You're failing forward. Just remember that. <laughs> Love it. And we will definitely try to get another session with you. I mean, let's see how it uh, pans out, but there's definitely a lot of interest. So we'll see how we can create that. But thank you okay. so much again. Thanks a lot yes. to the Thanks audience so for being here. <laughs>